Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Fiona Reynolds, and I'm the chair of the Green Alliance. And it's my great pleasure to introduce this really important event. I mean, the first thing to say is just how overwhelmed we are by the number of people who are joining us this morning. We've had over a thousand registrations, and I can see by the number of participants that we're clocking up really fast towards that number. Um, and I think that's really indicative of the enormous interest in the subject that we're going to be discussing today. In fact, it seems to me that this is a, a moment that is very timely, that is very important, and I think is rapidly becoming mission critical to us all. And so it feels like the response that it's generated is very much uh, of its moment and something that uh, needs to happen, a discussion that, that needs to happen. So we're really grateful to Ravina for chairing and to our speakers, who I know are going to bring great wisdom and insight this morning. I suppose the only message that I want to give at the beginning is just to say something slightly personal, uh, which is about the fact that this movement can change. Uh, I realized with a bit of a shock actually yesterday that it's 40 years ago this week that I started working in the environmental movement. That seems a very long time ago. At the time, there were literally no women in senior positions. The movement was very, very different. Uh, in that time, things have changed. Things need to change more. But I think as a movement, we can be confident that we can move forward and in, in doing so, do so in ways that respect the society and the world around us. So I'd like to uh, hand over to Ravina, who's going to chair the event today and just renew my warm welcome to you all. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you so much, Fiona, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted um, and honored to be joined by our three expert speakers. So firstly, we've got Maya Rose Craig, who's passionate about conservation and is the president of Black to Nature, an organization that fights for equal access to nature. And secondly, we've got Sharice Johnson, who's a policy advisor at the British Academy and has worked on a huge range of environmental and social issues. And finally, we have Safina Ahmed, um, the director of the John Elliman Foundation and previous chair of the expert panel on equality, diversity and inclusion at the Institute of Fundraising. So before um, we get cracking with our discussion, I just want to do a bit of housekeeping. Um, so if you've got any questions for our panelists, um, if you could please put them in the Q&A function as opposed to the chat box, um, that'll be really helpful for my colleague Gwen Buck to just sort of collate them as we're going along and put those to our panelists later on. Um, and also if you could thumb, uh, click the thumbs up button beneath a question that you really like, um, just so we can prioritize your favorite questions a bit better. Um, and if you'd like to tweet about the event at home, if you could please use the hashtag GA event. Um, great, so let's kick off our discussion. Um, so first I'm going to come to Maya Rose. So Maya Rose, um, as someone who's got such a strong connection to nature, I wonder if you could tell us about a really special experience you've had with nature, but also when it was you realised that we've got a serious problem um, around access to nature. Oh, yeah, I mean, firstly, thank you so much for asking me to speak today. I think it's amazing that this event is even happening. I've been doing diversity campaigning in the nature sector for nearly five years ago now. Um, and when I say that, like when I started this kind of event, never would have happened. Like I'm not exaggerating at all. Um, and I think like I feel very privileged because um, I grew up in a very rural area and I've always had a really, really strong connection to nature. My parents are bird watchers um, and they've always taken me out into green spaces. So I think it's always been a really integral part of my life. Um, and yeah, I have like countless amazing experiences with nature really that I could bring up today. Um, but for me, it was um, when I was a child and sort of that sudden realization that um, like, I suppose having that relationship with nature made my life better and I didn't want that to go um, like I, I always wanted to have that with me um, but yeah I think like I, I'm half Bangladeshi and although I was in like a little family unit it was my mum who's also Bangladeshi and my older sister and I who were all going out together along with my dad um, and it always felt you know really comforting I suppose but as I got older I sort of slowly started to realize that I just never really saw anyone that looked like me. 
Um, and I think that almost wasn't a light bulb moment. Like it was just that slow, um, really unpleasant realization. And I was really young at the time. I was about 11 or 12 when it suddenly like all came together for me. And um, at the time I didn't have any understanding of the issue at all. It just felt like a real tragedy that other kids um, from similar backgrounds to me weren't getting the same opportunities to me because I, again, I felt so privileged having been surrounded by nature all my life and I wanted other kids to have that opportunity. Um, so basically I started running nature camps. I set up my organization, Black to Nature, and I go out of my way to encourage VME or visual minority ethnic kids from inner city areas to come out into the countryside and give them that opportunity to engage with nature and to answer your earlier question that is probably my favorite moment of connection with nature because I think it it just brings a completely new perspective when you're taking people out into a space that's so alien to them um, and they just find everything so exciting even the things that I have sort of just accepted and become really mundane um, but I also do a lot of campaigning um, within the nature sector and um, yeah like I said I've been doing that for about five, five, about five years now um, and although it has been quite painful for a lot of it it feels very much like you're sort of shouting into the void and no one's really listening um, I, I don't know I feel optimistic I suppose and I think even the fact that again events like this are happening shows that people are finally prepared to listen and to try and create change. And I guess I can only hope that that will um, continue in the future because I really genuinely believe that we need all our different communities involved in order to make this environmental movement sustainable and in order to make sure that people really you know, care about saving the planet, care about saving our biodiversity. Because they Brilliant. Thank you so much, Myra. That, that was really really interesting to hear and, and like it's really interesting as well to hear how you've kind of reflected on your journey to where we are now and i wonder if, if what is kind of your hope and your vision at a time when you're we're trying to be optimistic and perhaps this is a moment where we no longer feel like we're talking into the void everybody is listening everybody is watching and everybody wants to change kind of what is it you hope for the future and yeah, how do you see, see Black to Nature? Yeah, that's a really well. interesting question. I think there's a lot of potential ways it could go at the moment. And my biggest hope is that because there is such, still such a lack of understanding of the issue in the sector, because, you know, it's almost a cyclical thing where there's not enough VME people, so no one understands the issue and it continues. I'm hoping that with events like this, where people are really listening to what we have to say and listening to what we want and therefore figuring out what these communities actually want from them rather than just guessing it means that they open up enough of a path forward that they can start to progress things and start to evolve in the way that they just haven't been able to in decades past um but yeah it, at the end of the day it requires a genuine desire for change from the sector and from these organizations and it's just not going to happen otherwise diversity isn't just going to fall into your lap you need to work for it Absolutely, absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you so much, my Rose. Um, so Sharice, I'm going to come to you now. Um, so as a policy advisor who's worked on overlapping issues of science, social justice and environmental justice, um, I wonder if you could talk about the way that NGOs have often worked quite separately um, on issues of environmental versus social justice. And importantly, why does that need to change now? Absolutely. Um, first, I have to say, to everybody who's uh, watching, I checked out what organizations many of you are from and noticed that some of you might be my future employee, employers. So I'm glad to see you here, truly. Um, I'm obviously here because I want to make sure you work on making it a better and more welcoming place for, for myself and for others who look like me to work when the time comes so we can make positive change and, and thrive together. Um, but in all seriousness, um, in my experience, uh, the social justice aspect has either been an add-on, a quick afterthought, or it's just eschewed altogether in environmental organizations. Uh, but the reality is that social justice is at the core of environmentalism. Inequalities don't exist in a vacuum. 
That's a universal truth. There are cumulative impacts or feedback loops, um, but the fragmented way that NGOs have worked on things, um, working on specific issues without considering full context, uh, these things haven't necessarily always been considered. But the problems do exist, and they don't just exist, um, you know, over there, like in the U.S. and the global south. They exist here as well. So, um, a couple of examples: uh, the town of Corby, where the burden of proof was put on the community to prove that toxic particles from a land reclamation project um, on a former British steel site had been inhaled or otherwise ingested by mothers and unwittingly poisoned their unborn children. Um, to prove that the toxins were airborne and could travel miles through the air to be inhaled by these mothers. Uh, another example, uh, Ella Roberta, the little girl from Lewisham in London who died some years back from air pollution, whose mother fights relentlessly for justice still. Um, those are just a couple of examples, but there's so many more um, and not always to do just with the air pollution. Um, there's a great need to share and collaborate more across and between sectors. Um, to apply a systems-based approach to solutions, but that's easier said than done. Um, we first, I mean, we need to create a space where that can happen in a more spontaneous way, create spaces where people have agency and their thoughts are heard and their ideas are supported. Um, and uh, so what, what I want from you all to take away from me in today's conversation is this, there's there's so many things that I wish I could tell you. Uh, there's so many conversations I want to have with all of you, but some things I just want you to take away today are, uh, you have to be able to hold several seeming truths at the same time uh, doing this kind of work. And quite often you'll need to sit in the discomfort. A truth like representation is our entire race and representation is not enough, nor is it the goal. And we need to find solutions quickly so people will stop needlessly bearing the brunt of burden due to the color of their skin. And um, you also can't rush this work. So hurry up and start. Um, then a few more things, you need to get input from your staff and you need to be sure not to be extractive or, or rely on the emotional labor of, of marginalized people. Uh, you need to collect data and understand we're more than data points. Um, then there's, Lastly, uh, the paradox of tolerance. Um, you need to be tolerant, but you shouldn't tolerate the intolerable. And with that said, I just wanna emphasize that I'm speaking, yes, as an individual who works at the British Academy, so I might share some of the things we do there, but uh, my opinions are not necessarily representative of the British Academy, and I draw primarily on my experiences before I moved to the UK. Brilliant, thank you so much, Cherise. And I'm, I'm just going to leave what you said there because that is absolutely powerful. And I think, yeah, we need to take a moment to really take in what you said. Um, thank you so much. Um, Safina, um, good morning. Um, so as director of the John Elliman Foundation, um, which often funds projects in the social action and environment sector, and someone who's been um, advocating for equality in the charity sector for a long time now, um, what do you think environmental NGOs and organisations more broadly need to do first to start tackling racism and issues of diversity and inclusion? Thank you. Um, really happy to be here and I'm so pleased that Green Alliance are hosting this discussion. I'm going to try and make sure with my answer I don't kind of um, touch on things that have already been covered, but I will say off the top that this is quite a difficult question to answer. Um, for me, there isn't one first thing that organisations must do to tackle issues of racism and of diversity and inclusion. Instead, I think that there are a whole host of things that organisations need to do first. And I know I don't have a lot of time, so I've broken it down into three buckets. And that's the first is to commit. The second is to coordinate your efforts and the third is to get comfortable. So committing to this work is so essential. It needs to happen at all levels of an organization, but especially at a board and senior level. Um, committing means that you need to embark on honest, difficult and uncharted conversations about the role you have played as individuals and as organizations in helping or hindering progress on equity, diversity and inclusion. And I would really encourage people to have a conversation about power and privilege and the way in which that can result in racist practice and hinder our progress towards equity, diversity and inclusion. 
essentially it's about committing to understanding that not only are we part of the problem, but we are part of the solution too. Secondly, coordinating your efforts. This means having a plan in place that is based on evidence and is a clear analysis of the work you need to do in order to become an anti-racist organization and an organization that's committed to equity, diversity and inclusion. For us as a funder, we're putting our plan together and the analysis that we've done so far is resulting in us reflecting on questions like, are the people that we fund representative of the sectors and communities we serve in the UK and the UK overseas territories? Is our funding accessible, equitable and inclusive or does it marginalise or disadvantage certain groups and causes over others? Is our approach to investments ethical and environmentally sustainable? And what role should we be playing as a member of the charitable funding sector to address the poor track record that the sector has in distributing its funds equitably, especially for communities of colour? Um, so the plan that you commit to based on the analysis that you undertake, needs to include baselines that allow you to compare yourself with others in your kind of stakeholder network. And it should allow you to think about the ways in which your current practice can be improved. Um, it needs to have ambitious targets because I think that's the only way that you can really re achieve improvement. And the plan needs to be well coordinated and it needs to take on board all of the assets you have as an organization and all of the assets you have access to. Um, I would also really say that in the development and delivery of your plan, please create safe and brave spaces that center and empower the voices and experiences of staff and stakeholders you work with who may have experienced the disadvantage and the marginalization that you're trying to now address. And finally, get comfortable. There's so much to do and unpack. It will take time. There are going to be quick wins and slow wins and everything between. There are going to be losses and mistakes along the way. There will be conversations and moments that are comfortable and inspiring and those that are deeply uncomfortable and difficult. But as long as there is a commitment to move ever forward and to do so with the right intentions, then progress is always possible. Brilliant, fantastic. Thank you so much, Safina. Um, and just as a follow up, and, and also I'm, I'm gonna try and open this particular question up to Myra and Sharice as well, because I'm sure you guys have thoughts on, you know, practical steps we can be taking and, and actions that organizations can be taking. But Safina, I wanted to ask, um, have you had experiences of, of kind of steps that have been taken that have worked, but also may not have worked? And kind of, do you have any reflections on perhaps where organizations kind of a path they shouldn't be going down and, and mistakes that have been made that you've seen? Um, so I've definitely had experience of working with and in organizations that are seemingly very much committed to equity, diversity and inclusion. But if you don't do, the work at the beginning to really center yourself in this conversation to understand where your perspectives are coming from. And it speaks to Sharice's point earlier about, you know, I am me, I can't represent a whole body of whatever label you've, you've decided to assign to me on a particular day. Um, so I think organizations that kind of commit to this because they know it's something that they need to tick in a box, um, without doing that work to really understand how they're grounded in this conversation, the role they play, the, the, you know, the mistakes they've made as well as the contributions they've made. I just feel that the targets become a little bit pointless or the work becomes a little bit pointless because you need to understand what your baseline is and what you're building up from. Um, and so I, I'm not going to kind of say, oh, this organization did it really well and this one didn't. I would flag that the Institute of Fundraising, the change collective work that they did, and I'm obviously biased as, as the, the previous chair, but you know, we went into that conversation and we did that kind of thinking and deep analysis work. And I think all of us involved would say that we probably all came into it with our own ideas of what we wanted to happen and intention behind why we were there but actually this the kind of result of that piece of work was far different from anything we imagined and it is also about just going with it and 
going where you're being led, if that makes sense, rather than coming into it with a sense of, I know what to do, this is what's going to happen, it's all a done deal, because then it's just not going to be an authentic or successful endeavour. Absolutely. Um, and Charisse, um, I just kind of wanted to open that question up to you as well in terms of practical steps um, that you think organisations um, should be thinking about and should be taking to increase diversity and inclusion. Um, yeah, um, well, first of all, everything Safina said, I mean, just round applause on all of that. <laughs> I'm with all of that. Um, I think on practical steps, the, the first thing Obviously, the first thing I think of is, is don't just focus on increased diversity and inclusion um, because uh, what you're implicitly saying is you've created a hostile environment that isn't fostering diversity and inclusion. Um, it's bigger than numbers and body count. So what, what sort of change do you want to see? Um, and then I guess uh, another thing I would say is, you know, just be like Nike and uh, just do it. The research is out there. Consultants exist, entire organizations dedicated uh, they're, to helping you become an anti-racist organization, um, not even just one that focuses on diversity and inclusion, they're, they're out there and they are, they're waiting for you just to reach out and, um, and uh, you know, ask for their services. Um, and uh, some of the other things I would say is obviously, you know, just ask yourself, yeah, who makes decisions about policies and procedures? How is that power and information shared? Um, who's missing from the conversation? How do Im how do different decisions impact different workers? Um, and then also, I would say uh, keep the understanding that training is well and good, very necessary, important. But as we all know, deficit of information doesn't always tra translate to behavior change. So before you go into that, definitely have kind of uh, uh, like a, a, a brisk analysis kind of to to guide you and and because you're going to it's going to be a struggle it's going to be hard i i don't have examples of organizations who are doing it great but i do have a lot of examples of organizations who are trying and making big mistakes and then learning from those mistakes ongoing it's ongoing so i think that would be a lot of my um uh, actually also one more thing um to be uh, kind of specific to the audience that we have here, I've, I'm thinking um, with your staff pages, your missions, your value statement, um, just like water quality surveys of streams, right? So you look at the macroinvertebrates that live in the streams as an indicator of the level of pollution. Uh, that's what we do with your staff pages and your mission and your value statements or lack thereof. We inspect the organizational stream. Um, and as I, uh, as I know from experience, that's even not enough if the internal culture is lacking. So having the right words to draw in the diversity when the organization itself isn't up for the change is a major bait and switch and that's something to keep in mind. Brilliant, thank you so much Charisse. Um, so Maya Rose, um, as someone who's um, a president of um, a grassroots organization as you are, um, I wondered if you could kind of talk about um, things you've learned as you've kind of grown as an organization and the fantastic camps that you set up for young people of color um, and just kind of how you've um, fostered a really safe and inclusive environment and kind of made sure that people of color who perhaps haven't had the, the fantastic privilege, not that it should be a privilege, but the privilege of enjoying nature and access to nature and just how you've created that environment and maybe things you've learned along the way. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, and I mean, firstly, I do just want to put out there like a bit of a self plug that Black to Nature is actually a consultancy organisation. We have done work in the past helping organisations figure out how to diversify their different projects and stuff. And I think um, like one of the big things that I had to learn immediately was that things that might be obvious to people from these communities are like absolutely not to people outside of them. Um, and I've actually run two conferences called Race Equality in Nature, all about figuring out in a really systematic way um, what the barriers are and why there aren't people from these communities engaging with nature. Um, yeah, and I think your usage of the word privilege just then is really interesting because I think um, during lockdown, I've been thinking a lot about privilege and how um, access to green spaces and the countryside and nature in the UK is absolutely a privilege. Like it's something that you need to 
have enough money and enough time and enough energy to go out and do um because otherwise it becomes absolutely inaccessible and a lot of the um green spaces in um cities just are really degraded they're not very like they're just not very nice basically people don't want to spend time in them and i think um obviously it is two separate issues but it would be like slightly disingenuous not to acknowledge the fact that there's a really strong link between class and race and the fact that a lot of people aren't going out into green spaces because there's also a massive issue with working class people just not going out into the countryside and i think that's also something that needs to be acknowledged um and i think yeah in the in terms of the camps again it's been a massive learning curve um and i think the most difficult part of running them is um you know convincing the parents that it's a good thing for their kids to do that they're going to be safe they're going to be looked after um it's all going to be um really well run in the way that they like so for example a lot of muslim parents are comforted by the fact that we're muslim so they know all the food's going to be halal they know the girls and boys are going to be completely separate in their tents stuff like that um which like a lot of these parents don't even send their kids on school camp so it is something that's completely alien to them and i think um you know it, br it brings up the conversation of why um these people from these communities aren't engaged with nature in the first place like historically not currently and personally i think it, it ties into class again where we have this massive issue where people are migrating here and they want to build new lives and they need to support their families and they're living in they're moving into urban spaces when before they've absolutely been rural people um and they have no time for nature and i think that's um been passed down so that now a lot of um people in my generation feel like they are urban people they do not belong in the countryside and i think um something that could be really important going forward is reclaiming that um that historical rural heritage um yeah but at the end of the day the biggest lesson i've learned is just reframing nature and figuring out that even though i consume it in a very certain way like i'm a bird watcher i like knowing all the names of stuff and like like recording it all and things like that that doesn't do it for a lot of people um and i think just coming to terms with the fact that in the uk we have a very certain view of what engaging with nature is and it's much broader than that you can you can just go out and sit in the park and watch the squirrels run around and that is engaging with nature because it's green space and it's wildlife and i think you know getting your binoculars and going birding just doesn't do it for a lot of people and by finding different ways for people to connect um it makes a massive difference and they really can just engage like that brilliant thank you that that was wonderful thank you so much um and something else i wanted to touch on and safina you kind of already touched on the role of boards and kind of senior leadership um so i kind of wanted to ask all of you um how can leadership teams within the sector including boards as well be held accountable on this issue. So not just kind of saying the right things at the moment and kind of showing the good intentions, but obviously this is going to be a long journey and this is not something that we need to start and stop today. This is going to be a long journey. So how do we continue to make sure that our senior leadership teams and board are accountable? And Safina, is it all right if I come to you first? Uh, yeah, um, could go on for hours hours on this um, targets and commitment to those targets um, is probably the, the simplest and shortest way I could respond. Um, I really believe that if boards and leadership teams are not committed to this agenda, then if you've got people at lower levels who, let's face it, tend to be um, of a kind of broader um, background in terms of people of colour are more likely to be at lower levels of organisations, unfortunately, then, you know, they alone can't make their experience of an organization better and the stakeholders you work with are also kind of a step removed from your organization and if they're kind of experiencing the disadvantage or marginalization that might be occurring because of the practices you engage in then you know unless your board and your senior leadership team are visibly committed to this work then it is impossible to feel that an organization will progress in my opinion and um, it's not to say that they're the only part of the solution, they are just one element of it. Um, I think having targets is really important, as I mentioned. I also think that a board and a leadership team that is 
comfortable in engaging in a public discourse on these types of topics is really important. It kind of speaks to points already made that, you know, if this is important to you, then that should be clear when we look at your websites, when we uh, talk to you in meetings and when we go to your events. Um, if it's not coming across clearly, then there is an issue. You're not saying what you think you might be saying. Um, and so it needs to be something that just kind of is an aspect of all that you do across all of your activities. But I do think that senior teams and boards are, are so essential in driving that forward. And I do think that targets and visibly talking about it and reporting on what you're doing is, is really important. Absolutely. Um, Sharice, have you got anything else to add on, on top of what Safina said? Uh, yeah, um, so definitely agree with everything she said, but um, something else that I was thinking is, you know, what does it even mean to be kept accountable when you have all the power, right? Um, we say that a lot, um, but it seems to be almost empty. So your job is to fill it and give it meaning. Create, create your own accountability. Let your employees tell you what they need from you. Um, and again, yeah, be explicit about your support for racial justice, uh, examine your own biases, your own complicity, work on yourself first, Criti critically acknowledge how you might be perpetuating inequity in your organizations, on your teams, examine the systemic racism in your own organization, in company policies and procedures. And um, yeah, another important thing would definitely be creating measurable outcomes with timelines. And even if you, have the capacity to do so, creating leadership programs to combat the glass ceiling racism, that would be an excellent step. Um, otherwise, uh, one, one way you'll notice that you're doing something wrong is uh, when you've got a mass exodus of your POC staff. Absolutely, great, thank you, Cherise. Um, and Maya Rose, I wanted to come to you on a slightly different question. And I know this is gonna be quite a challenging question, so there's no right or wrong answer at all but just kind of thinking about um do we need a complete systems change is there kind of a fundamental problem with how the environment sector has been operating that has led us to this point or do you think it's kind of some kind of smaller but kind of across the scale changes that need to happen what, what are your thoughts on on your experience so far um yeah that is a really interesting question and to an extent, I think one that maybe isn't important in that there probably isn't going to be a complete upheaval and reshuffle of the sector and we are stuck in a situation where we have to work with what we have, I suppose. Um, and which is why which is why we're here talking about all these things. And I think um, one thing that would make a massive difference is people really sitting down and thinking about their own um, prejudices because everyone has them and I think partially because of the type of people that end up working in the nature sector where it's very liberal and very middle class people don't want to think that they have prejudices and they don't want to think that they could possibly be racist because they're not I don't know committing hate crimes um, and I think you know even again in like the short period that I've been doing stuff I've experienced um, a lot of like microaggressions and racism and I think people really do just need to sit down and have a think about um, why I suppose why they're interacting with a BME person in this way or why they're coming from this direction and things like that um, and I think also um, yes for various historical reasons we've ended up with a very small section of society within the nature sector um, and I guess just thinking about like what why we have these sort of traditional ways in like so for example many people have to do years worth of free volunteering to get a job because it's so oversubscribed and most people just cannot afford to do that they don't have the time they don't have the money and they will just go off and do another job and I think and people then go like oh I don't know why we don't have um, people from like lower socioeconomic backgrounds coming into the job and it's like that that's why um, and I think you know just I suppose really self-examining and like I suppose thinking past what's already going on thinking about the whys of it all does make a massive difference and I think 
also something that historically has been quite a large issue is kind of what we were talking about earlier, like this pushing of diversity to the side. Like, so I know a lot of organizations that have their diversity officer, um, which doesn't work for a variety of reasons, but partially because a lot of the time these diversity officers are just, I suppose, the same as everyone else in the organizations, but also because diversity doesn't work if you just have one person working behind the scenes to try and get more people involved. Diversity works if it's a core value of your organization. Again, it's something you really desire, something you really want. Um, but I think if it was possible to have like system change, I suppose, I think the main thing really would just be, um, I suppose, a slice of every single different section of society really coming together harmoniously to figure out how to save the environment and how to, I suppose, save the world. Um, and I guess it's that vision that we're working towards at the moment. Great. Well, I think that's a wonderful note um, to end um, this discussion section. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Gwen Buck, um, who's got some fantastic questions for our panellists um, from the audience. Thanks, Gwen. Um, thanks, Ravina. Um, yes, thanks so much to everyone who submitted questions in advance um, and who's also um, submitted them into the Q&A box. We've had some fantastic questions. Um, they're sort of broadly categorised into, um, you know, how we got here um, to requesting practical steps we can all take to um, address racism in the environment sector. Um, so in terms of just setting the scene, um, you know, We've had this question submitted in advance. This is from Joan, uh, Joanne Sherwood from um, RSVB Northern Ireland, um, the director there. What is the biggest barrier to racial equality in the environment sector? Um, I don't know who would like to start that first. Um, perhaps uh, Charisse? Um, sure. I mean, I've, I'd say there's definitely several, but um, as Myra just mentioned, you know, with um, with jobs, even with, with getting people into jobs, you have to have all of you know, the volunteer work and everything. I was just thinking about my own personal experience and how I came into it and how incredibly frustrating that was and how much you know uh, debt I ended up having to go in to get a master's degree because that's the kind of thing that everybody was looking for. But you know, I stuck with it, but who? not everyone can do that. So that is a huge barrier. A huge barrier is just even getting your foot in the door. For sure. Great, thank you. And um, Safina, do you want to come in? Um, just very briefly, I think it's actually a problem that's happening in the charity sector more widely. And the barrier is that people don't believe it's a problem. And I think that there is definitely progress that's happening at a faster pace than it has been for the kind of 10 years that I've formally worked in the sector. Um, but I think that's a barrier. I think people feel that we're doing good and therefore we are good. And that definitely applies to a lot of what we do, but this problem does exist and acknowledging it is a way in which we can start to really um, have some progress. Great. Um, Gwen, over to you again. Thanks. Um, another question submitted in advance was from Sarah Mukherjee, who's the CEO of the Institute of Economic, uh, Environmental Management Association. Um, and it's a bit of an interesting question because I think um, it will all, you know, you'll have quite different um, answers to it, but it's who is ultimately responsible for the lack of diversity in the sector? And Maya Rose, do you want to have a go? I know it's a, it's a big question, but you can take it in, a, in any direction that you, that you think. Yeah, sure. I mean, again, I, I think, like, I feel like I'm saying the same things over and over, but I feel like part of this issue is sort of because the environmental sector or environmental NGOs have been around for ages in the UK. Like, we have a really long history of caring about the environment, particularly if you're middle class and you're, or you're upper class and you have, like, extra money to spend on those sorts of things. And I think um, you know, we've got a lot of that stuff still hanging over us. Um, and it means that we have the same sort of people getting involved, but I think, um, you know, also it, it's not fair to entirely blame it on history either. There's a lot of things happening right now. Like we were talking about jobs, 
but also um, I think in a lot of our communities there's sort of a lack of understanding or appreciation of the nature sector and the charity sector in general as well um, so like I know for example of quite a few kids my age that were interested in going into nature or doing like a degree that was related like zoology um, and because their parents didn't have that understanding and because they you know they want the best for their children and they want them to go and do jobs where they're going to go and make loads of money and be really successful and maybe become very middle class um, and because there isn't that understanding they won't let their kids go and do jobs like that and I think um, that speaks of the massive disconnect between um, you know, the environmental movement and the environmental sector in general and our communities um, that, you know, speaks of the wider issue, I suppose. Um, and like, so like, I know it's quite surprising for us, but a lot of people in my Bangladeshi family, for example, don't know anything about lack of biodiversity, don't know anything at all about climate change, um, don't know, like don't have any knowledge at all about any of these issues. And I think um you know there's a really really big communications issue going on that's just not really being acknowledged great thanks my rose um sharice um who do you feel is is ultimately ultimately responsible here um yeah i would say uh, well again i agree with everything my rose said but um in my experience as you know, an American anyway, I would say the historical aspect has so much to do with it, especially with, with racism and the gatekeeping of the environmental sector and it being a, a very white space. Because, you know, um, the way I see it, our communities, you know, like black communities, uh, different Asian communities, whatever, whatever the case may be, we have been outside, like we've been in the environment, like we, there's a strong, there's a rich culture and history of us being a part of the environment and and really respecting it and 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 understanding it what's happened then then you have racist structures in place that just keep pushing us back getting leaving us out of it by any you know whatever the case may be either it's um you know you uh, you don't get paid anything you have to be come from a wealthy family to begin with to get in, to stay in these spaces because you're not going to get paid much because you have to take on all these free internships because you have to you know do all this volunteering i think that's a huge part of it um you know again drawing on the us is you know one of the things you hear a lot is you know for example why do why do black people not swim well why why don't we swim because when when we tried to when we tried to go into the same pools as white people we would get acid thrown into the water or on us you know so we see so we start moving away from this so intergener intergener i cannot say that word right now generationally you have people passing on like no this is a space that we don't enter because we're not welcome and that continues and so we're trying now to break those break those barriers and change that and like my rose mentioned earlier we're trying to reframe it because and reclaim it because like i said we've been we've been here we've been in these spaces and we'd like to come back but we need it, we need it to be more equitable so it's it's something we can actually try to do great thank you sharice um, and Safina, did, did you want to come in on that question as well? Um, just really briefly, I do absolutely agree with what Sharice and Myra Rose have been talking about and reclaiming and thinking about it in terms of our history has really kind of struck a chord in a way that I wasn't expecting this morning. Um, but the thing I would say is it is about um, the systems that we are favouring in terms of our educational systems and our political systems and the way in which we are all part of that. So we have a role to play in kind of dismantling or reimagining them. But I do feel that we are in a situation whereby, you know, education systems write a certain narrative, which means that we, if you don't see yourself in it, you don't realise you're part of it. Um, the same is true for political systems. We have one that is very comfortable in othering or labeling different groups based on, you know, characteristics or stereotypes or whatever else it might be. And I know it seems trite or simplistic to say, but if you don't see yourself, then you don't be, you don't see yourself there. You're not going to achieve it. You're not going to think that that's 
a space for you. It's as simple as that, as well as all of the very complex things that Sharissa Myros have kind of articulated far better than I ever could. So. Brilliant. Thank you, Safina. Um, Gwen, do we have another question? Um, yes, we've had quite a few questions about um, the role that funders play. Um, so I guess this is more towards Safina, but um, how might environmental NGOs better work with funders and tackle racism? So I think as funders, we have a um, lot of work to do on ourselves in terms of improving our own processes and systems to ensure that they are equitable and inclusive and that we aren't marginalizing or um, committing to racist practice, whether we you know, meant to do so or not. So I think first and foremost, we need to really focus on ourselves and improve the way in which we distribute our grants as well as reviewing the way in which we might invest and um, particularly for those of us with endowments um, but even those that are fundraising think about where your money is coming from um, and whether or not that's kind of um, exacerbating the harms that you're trying to then um, eradicate through your grant making um, in terms of how we can work together with environmental NGOs and um, you know work collectively to redress the system and improve it um then it is it's conversations like these it's having um spaces and places in which we can start to think about how we can improve as a sector um i think it's about accountability obviously as a funder i have a lot of power and privilege and you're not really ever going to disagree with me if you think that a check is on its way um but there is work to be done in terms of how do we work with you in a way that is not a power imbalance but a more balanced way to say you know what is it that your organization needs in order to um progress in this area and how is how can we as a funder support you recognizing that we're not perfect in this either um and yeah so that's kind of um some of the ways in which we can help and, and within um our kind of sector body, we have uh, the Association for Char uh, Charitable Foundations. They have a diversity, equity and inclus inclusion working group that's doing a lot of work around how we better manage the data and the um, evidence around this so that we can Im improve as a sector as a whole. Um, and there are others that I'll, I'll shout out as well, I'm sure. Yeah, and if I, sorry, if I can quickly speak about my personal experiences, like as someone who's running a grassroots organisation, I'd say that I've had a really, really difficult time getting any funding. And in the last year or so, I've had a really difficult time trying to become an official charity in the first place, mm -hmm. just because again, there's this complete um, lack of understanding of the issue and I keep on being blocked from that because um, I keep on being told that VME people aren't going out into the countryside so there's no need for my organisation which um, obviously is the whole purpose of my organisation but that means that it's really difficult to get funding and I think that if there was more um, education in general and maybe sorry, more understanding about these sorry. completely unacceptable from a funder like at the end of the day the people we fund are the experts we aren't we are you know as at element we're you know generalists but specialists in three funding categories but ultimately the people we partner with are the experts so for someone to say or a funder to say that you know well BME people don't go out into the countryside well, I mean, I just, I'm Especially sorry. When, I, no, it's okay. It's just like, for me, it feels like very um, purposeful ignorance, I suppose, just because like, like I said, we've been doing this for five years now. We've been really successful. There's like hundreds of kids that want to um, work with us. And again, I, th I think, um, you know, like there's just a complete lack of understanding around these issues and the purpose of like the kind of change that we're trying to create. Brilliant. Um, great. Well, um, I think we'll stop there um, with questions from the audience, unless Gwen, you want to squeeze in last one, uh, a last one. Um, there are so many amazing questions, but I think in order to stick to time, we might have to move on now. Sure. sure. Great. Um, so um, just kind of for a final remark, I'm just going to kind of leave you with a question, but this is just also an opportunity to just kind of round up. Um, could you tell us about an inspiring approach 
or action, no matter how big or small, um, that you've seen an environmental organisation take um, in order to tackle racism or issues of diversity and inclusion. Um, Maya Rose, I'm going to come to you first. Yeah, of course. Um, so something I've been talking about quite a lot over the years is representation in media. Um, and the fact, so for example, there was this project where they were going into schools that were mainly minority ethnic and all of the pictures where they had like 15 kids in these PowerPoints, like in a single picture, I mean, they were all white and it was very much like, you know, constantly sending out this message that like, you're not the type of person who engages with, with nature. Um, but I just remember like a moment for me was when I opened the post and I had like a kid's RSPB magazine that was for my niece. And I like opened the package up and on the front page was just this young Asian girl. And I just like, it just made me tear up a bit because I read that magazine when I was a kid and it was just thinking like, if I had been younger and I saw that kind of thing, it would have meant so much to me. And I'm so glad that kids now are seeing themselves reflected back um, in the media they're consuming. Brilliant, thank you, Maya Rose. Um, Charisse, I'm gonna to come to you next. Um, yeah, so um, so the things we've discussed briefly in today's panel barely skimmed the surface and, you know, you'll all need to delve deeper and sit with the discomfort, like I mentioned, and think creatively and inclusively about solutions. But I, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to pat anyone on the back just yet. So the fact that we're only just having this conversation right now highlights the fact that we have a great deal to do yet. Um, understanding that the work isn't about self-congratulation um, and the most inspiring work honestly that I've seen exist at the margins you know in communities but with that said I will give a little kudos um, I'd like to mention what the National Trust has done recently they made a statement about their history of slavery and colonialism which was met with support from some and vitriol from others and um, I just wanted to use this as an example to tell everyone you know this is something that that, that honestly you have to get used to because it's going to happen. It's, it's not easy to do. You'll have to tell people, um, you'll have people telling you, I mean, that they're going to cancel memberships, withdraw support. And, um, and my advice to you is just to stay steadfast and uh, continue trying to just, just keep your eye on the prize and remember that we're just trying to dismantle racism. Brilliant, thank you. And Safina, we'll finish with you. Um, so I wanted to highlight the Environmental Funders Network. Um, firstly, if you're a philanthropist or philanthropic organisation funding in the environmental sector um, and you aren't a member of the network, then I would encourage you to look into changing that. Um, so I want to highlight them for two reasons um, as to why they've kind of inspired me. Um, the first is the Environmental Funders Network do a newsletter regularly and they circulated one on the 12th of June this year. And the newsletter is always open with like a short statement from their brilliant director, Florence Miller. And in her opening of that newsletter in June, she talked so um, decisively and succinctly about Black Lives Matter. And um, it was just that moment of her really, for me, it demonstrated real allyship, leadership and grit because she was so clear it was an issue and it needed to be addressed. Um, and she gave some really thoughtful readings that we could look at and it was just a really powerful moment and you know we were kind of in the midst of the lockdown at that point and um, we were all a bit tired and run down and, and overwhelmed I certainly felt that way and it was just a real bright spot and the second reason is because at this year's Environmental Funders Network retreat um, in March they held a session on power and privilege in philanthropy and beyond and it was a really brave and safe space in which we as funders could talk about the ways in which our work harms and hinders um, our commitments to equity, diversity and inclusion and, and anti-racism. Um, and so for me, the retreat, the newsletter, they're both just great examples of an organisation that is committing to tackling racism and to delivering equity and, and inclusion. Brilliant. Thank you, Safina. That's really, really useful. Um, so just kind of a a, a final closing from me and um, thank you so much for everyone's involvement um, and I'd like to say a special thank you to our 
amazing speakers. Um, and just to say how much I appreciate all three of you um, coming here today to talk about an issue that I have no doubt has personally affected all of us um, and a lot of audience members at home. So I just want to kind of acknowledge that this is no small task and no small thing that you've all done coming here today. Um, so thank you. Um, and to our audience members um, who perhaps have been kind of lucky enough to not have been personally affected by systemic racism. Um, I say to you, allies are everything. Um, kind of people of colour in the environment sector cannot do this work alone. We should not be doing this work alone. We absolutely must do this work together. And the sheer number of you who have come along to this event today shows me that that's what we're going to do. We are doing this together. We're starting here. Um, this is not absolutely not the end. Um, and it's going to be a long um, and hard but fantastic journey of, of making real change. And um, so thank you, everyone. Um, great, so I'm now going to hand over to Jo for a few closing words um, before we say a, give a round of applause to our speakers. Thanks, Jo. Great, thank you, Ravina, and thank you to all of our panellists again for such an insightful and thoughtful conversation. Um, and great that so many people have been able to, to be part of it um, and, and show the uh, appetite for change. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about Green Alliance in this. Um, you know, we're really at the early stages of our work to unpack and address racism in our organisational structures and our policy work. Um, earlier this year, we've come up with a plan for an active diversity and inclusion programme with some of the practical measures that have been talked about today and also about how we represent diverse communities in our communications and in events like this. But I think one of the key things is that we also realise that we need to keep on learning and better understanding the experiences of people in different communities and to not come up with the answers straight away, but to try and find out and learn and listen to different voices. So whilst we're definitely not paragons of best practice yet, we want to get there and we feel that enabling these conversations and sharing across the sector is critical for us to do that. And as has already been said, sometimes that will be very uncomfortable for a lot of us, but only until it isn't. So let's keep trying and let's keep making progress. So I just wanted to let you know about a few other initiatives and there's a few been mentioned already by uh, panelists here today. So we'll try and round those up and share them with uh, all the attendees today. But I just wanted to let you know our friends at Wildlife and Countryside Link have been convening a group of environmental NGOs who are looking at a lot of the diversity challenges in the sector and will be providing useful insights on their work. So keep an eye on their website for updates uh, and maybe get in, in touch with Richard at Link if you'd like to be more involved, although you may not appreciate me saying that given there's still 600 plus people on the, on the webinar today. Um, and in mid-October, AIMA, the Institute for Environmental Management Assessment, will be holding a meeting for environmental chief execs hosted by AIMA's CEO, Sarah Mukherjee, who we had a question from earlier. Um, as a person of colour in the sector, she's going to be suggesting actions that can be taken to increase diversity and inclusion and inviting guests to comment and sign up to a plan that includes some challenges in actions so let her know if you'd like to participate we'll um, circulate her contact details after the event um, here at green alliance we plan to run some follow-up events so we'd love to hear your feedback on today's session and suggestions for future discussions um, but finally you know all of us have attended this event because we recognize the importance of addressing racism in the environment sector the moral case is evident, making our organisations more inclusive is absolutely the right thing to do. But we also need to make sure that we're able to increase public support for our environmental causes. And in order to do that, we need a better understanding of diverse communities, a better understanding of their connection to the environment, to nature and to the range of concerns about climate change and of social justice. And of course, a better understanding of the barriers to inclusion. So including more diverse range of voices in all of our work, in our case for the environment, can only strengthen our work going forward. So I'd just like to finish up now by giving uh, another heartfelt thanks to all of our panellists. It's been brilliant today to Cherise, to Maya Rose, and good luck on the Greenpeace ship, and to Sabina, 
thank you very much and uh, I look forward to seeing how we progress and support each other over the coming months and years. So please join me in thanking our panellists in a virtual round of applause.